convince her to talk tonight. And uh, I'm so happy that he, she agreed. And she used to work in, uh, that is University of Washington, right, Aggie? Yeah. How do you call that? And he's a, she's an anesthesiologist by profession. And so he has all these credentials in the FIPP, CIPS, ASRA, PMUC. And he's the organizing faculty of the Pain School International. This is the training center for you to uh, qualify and uh, be able to pass and learn uh, and uh, pass all these exams. And uh, she's been very active there. And uh, he's very gracious that uh, she allowed me to pass last year in CIPS. So thank you very much, Dr. Agi. <laughs> So tonight, I would like to welcome all of you. But before we begin, uh, I would like to invite everyone to, to have a short prayer. We will have a short prayer, Dr. Agi. Let's pray. Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for your grace and we thank you for your goodness. As we begin our uh, conference tonight, we would like, Lord, to invite your presence to be upon us. Kindly be with each one of us. That as we learn things together, your name will be glorified. Be with Dr. Agi, especially as she shares to us your knowledge and skills in uh, spine PRP. Thank you for your grace and your goodness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, Dr. Agi, it's all yours now. So, you can begin talking now. Welcome to Mask Ultrasound meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie, really for the invitation. It's always an honor. I'm going to say it's much nicer when I get to see the audience in person. But these are the times we live now, so we'll go with this. So I'm going to talk about regenerative medicine for the spine. It is truly my passion, or one of my passions. And I've been doing it since 2006. So you see, we've done a lot of cases, and this is the treatment I do for my mother and father and son and husband and family. Uh, other than the patients. I, I'm truly convinced it's the new way to go. I have no financial interest in any of the of the companies. Uh, I'm on the education board for the WIP and the vice chair of Hungarian WIP section and I teach for a variety of of societies. So this, I collected it for for um, for a, for a talk, really we started doing prolotherapy in 2006. I actually learned it from Dr. Andrea Trescott, which who many of you I'm sure know. Uh, she was my, one of my mentors and I'm still grateful for her for many things other than this as well. And then we bought our first PRP machine, the harvest machine in 2006, because I thought it has to be working the same way as prolotherapy. And over the time, we've done over 6,000 6, lumbar spine and 1,000 cervical spine cases. And of course, some thoracic, I haven't counted. And this is what I thought I would talk about, the diagnostic approach to the spine. What do we inject and why? I think this is the beef of the talk. If you just pay attention to this part, that's possibly enough <laughs> for further success, because the rest is, Injection technique and evidence, you can read that as well. So if you put uh, PRP in PubMed, you will find over 17,000 results. And if you put PRP review, you still find over 2,000. And if you put PRP size spine, it's still 1,300. So it's a lot of publications. And the number of publications are going up uh, year by year. I expect 2020 to bring even more than 2019. So one thing you can say, this is truly the hot, uh, a hot topic of pain medicine. Maybe that is the new direction that you want to take if you find that steroids fail you. And steroids will fail you. So what's the concept? I'm sure you guys all understand. The concept is that somehow we trigger an inflammatory cascade. If you cut your finger, and it gets red hot and swollen, as Andrea Tresco says, it is the inflammatory process that helps uh, the cut to heal. So that's exactly what we want to mimic when we inject PRP or other uh, injectates for regenerative medicine. 
this is how how I see uh, the various regenerative medicine technique feeding in uh, to the healing process. I will start at the very end. Look at the green box. We want tissue healing. I look at the red box. It is inflammatory cascade that will take you to tissue healing. Now the inflammatory cascade uh, is initiated by the platelet activation. In that case, you can put PRP directly to the injured area, but especially in not so rich countries, you can use prolotherapy, which creates a cell injury, the lipid membranes that get exposed, and it triggers the platelet activation. It's significantly cheaper and maybe similarly very good. And you can also inject stem cells, but one thing you need to remember, uh, a week later of the injection, only at most 1% of the stem cells are at the site where you injected. So the stem cells, they, what they do really is they orchestrate the inflammatory cascade. So what's the concept and the diagnostic approach for the spine? Well, you look at this. Huh? I should think I'm new to it. Hmm. Yeah. So what's the what's video, the approach? Video off hai. Video off hai. Video off hai or sound off hai? Don't know off hai niche wale. Okay. So if you look at these images, they are identical. Both of them cervical spine. But the left side of the image has, a, has the cervical ligaments. And the ligaments are what hold the bones together. The bones are the building bricks and the ligaments keep them together. And then of course, on top of that comes the muscle layer and that will make the, the head and the neck move with a little bit of simplification. And this is what happens to your neck if you lose your ligaments. So let's look at it in a little bit more detail. Uh, here. So here you can see, just one sec, I'm getting a pointer here. So you can see, let's think of a trauma patient, think of a whiplash injury patient, because that's very easy to understand. But a similar thing happens with wear and tear, with lots of computer work or posture where people are leaning forward. So with the whiplash, there is a damage from the flexion extension and you lose these ligaments, the interspinous ligaments, or they get stretched. That means that the spinous processes will separate and you lose your cervical lordosis. That's what we always see in the MRI, loss of cervical lordosis. Now, if you lose your cervical lordosis, first, there is stress on the facet joints and they will be painful. There is also a forward pressure on the disc, so the disc eventually will bulge out. When the disc bulges out, it's a lot of problems already in this neck, right? The posterior longitudinal ligament is very tender. Here you can already have discogenic pain, facet pain, and the ligaments do hurt as well. And if things get worse, then of course the disc can bulge out enough, so it's going to put pressure on the exiting nerve root. That's when your patient presents to you with radiculopathy. Initially, they say, I have neck pain, it gets tired. And then when this comes, then they have the pain going down the arm. This is a movie I, I used to show my patients. It's very complicated to get. Uh-oh. Not quite sure. Okay, so this is a movie I used to show to my patients. Uh, there is a four, when this is lumbar spine, the spinous process separates, the disc bulges out and puts pressure on the nerve. And the good news is that the disc actually, just like on this, likes to go back to its normal place. So the moment the biomechanics improves, the disc is very happy to go back to its normal position. So this is how I see uh, low back or neck pathophysiology. And I think this simplifies the picture. This is how I distribute the patients in various groups by, for treatment. 
So I think of extraspinal pathology, and that's of course the ligaments we talked about, the facets and the muscle attachments. If it gets really bad, then it will lead to disc pathology, and that can be the discogenic pain itself. If the disc leaks, right, it's a body foreign material, then there's going to be the uh, exiting nerve root irritation. Patients often say it's this burning pain and they cannot sit. And of course, there's a physical compression of the nerve if the disc bulges out. And then I also think of the intraspinal pathologies, which is partly coming from the disc, is the mechanical compression of the nerve and the nerve root chemical irritation. The treatment approach goes accordingly. If it's extraspinal, I will put PRP or prolotherapy. If it's intraspinal, I still do, do steroid injections, mostly in the form of epidural lysis, which is just about a million times better than any regular transferaminal or interlaminal epidural steroid injection. At least in my hands, that's what I find. And some studies show that you can put PRP uh, intraspinal as well. It's not very strong evidence yet. And when it comes to disc, then I put disc in the disc PRP or stem cells. So this is the first uh, conclusion slide. When you treat spine, you need to think in functional units. I think part of the reason that the facet studies fail or they are not that great, or the transfer amino studies are not that great, because they never think in a functional unit. If you just treat part of the problem, you're not getting the good outcomes. So what do we treat? with regenerative medicine in the spine. We can think of disc, facet, fascia, ligament, tendon, and the epidural. I'm gonna go through the individual targets because that's how the literature is assembled, but I still want you to think in functional units. So lumbar spine. So for the lumbar spine, we are looking at facets. What do I inject when I, inject, when I treat facets? I treat the supraspinous ligaments for the reason I just explained. I treat the facet joints. I treat the iliolumbar lumbar ligaments. I treat the SI joint. Not always, but often the thoracolumbar fascia and the sacred tuberous and sacred spinous ligaments. What's the evidence? I start with the good news. Uh, this is a study mostly for musculoskeletal. So if you look in the small letters, but don't, epicondylitis, epicondylitis, patella, patella. So it's not spine studies, but the good news, there is no major complication. Uh, so these are the studies. The serious one is a level one study by Wu. It's a prospective randomized control trial. That's the only one we have so far. He compared PRP versus local anesthetic and corticosteroids. At the beginning, there's no difference. However, look, at six months, and you want six months, PRP is better. There's another one, prospective series level four. The Kirchner study here, 2006, that actually is very interesting, I think, because he, the, he published the only study with PRP where he treated a functional unit. He did not only inject facet, he injected transferaminally and disc as well. Now, 86 patients, not too bad. And the outcomes are super. I don't think many doctors believe him, but I do. I think this is what you can expect if you think in functional units. So no adverse events, that's awesome. I don't think that we can skip lumbar facet prolotherapy because that's really, I think in the Philippines, you will do a lot of prolotherapy and you will do a lot of, will help a lot of patients for affordable amount. So these studies, this is a level one by Dachau. Uh, what he found is no significant difference uh, between the two groups, the sailing group and the prolo, but even at a year, both groups were doing better. So that tells me that the placebo was not a true placebo. And again, Kirchner, the same doctor, he did the prolo study as well, 
uh, with 177 patients, again, excellent outcomes. No adverse events. So how do you pick your facet patients? It's the same way as you pick them for lumbar medial branch block. You understand the mechanism of injury. They say, I lifted something heavy and twisted, and then it hurts. They were rear-ended, or they have a poor posture. Those are your patients. When you examine them, they show pain on extension and rotation. What's the technique? The technique is the exact same as when you do other procedures in the spine. I inject the supraspinous ligaments, as discussed before, right? Very easy, the supraspinous ligament, the spinous process is between my fingers, so I inject on bone. Here I inject the facet and the transverse process. I'm trying to start the movie, oops, failed. Oh no, just give me one second, I need to find how do I get back my... Okay, how do I have my pointer? Sorry about it. So here, this is what I do. I come from lateral to medial. This is my transverse process, right? So I'm targeting transverse process. And this is prolotherapy, 15% sugar water. And I pull my needle back, and now I'm targeting the facet. And you don't have to put extra, extra effort into getting into the joint. As long as you get to the joint capsule, you get the desired inflammatory cascade. And then I redirect one more time and inject on the lamina. That's where the multifidus attach. Okay. But you can, of course, whatever is in your toolbox, you can use x-ray. This is the facet injection, x-ray guided. Here I am injecting the. Uh, here I'm injecting the transverse processes. Here again the transverse process of L5 and L4, which is part of the lumbar ligament, and here this is really. Uh, quadratus lumborum attachment. So what's with the spine, uh, in the spine with the disc? Let's look at the literature first. We have quite a few studies. The one thing I want to point out uh, is that most studies actually are looking at at least six months. That's really good news. Uh, two of, uh, Lee, Carl Lutz is the, the lead author on this. He has a prospective double-blind randomized controlled study, 47 patients, and intradiscal PRP shows significant, uh, significant improvement even after a year. And then here you find another prospective uh, trial and then case series. All of them have actually good outcome with no significant uh, side effects, except for this one, which is a discitis that happened. Uh, you need to be careful when you inject the disc. I don't think it's a regenerative medicine complication. It's an injection complication. It's lack of pre-op antibiotic, which you always need to do when you do disc, and lack of clean enough needle and sterile conditions. I wanted to show you a couple of slides on animal data because that's interesting. I don't think we can say it for human yet, but with the PRP in rabbits, you can actually see an improved MRI signal intensity on the disc. And this is the other animal study that I find very important. And you may, maybe you can draw a somewhat premature conclusion for human treatments. Uh, in rabbits, if you inject leukocyte-rich PRP, you further deteriorate the discs. If you inject leukocyte poor, then you improve the discs. What's with the epidurals? Uh, there are a few studies with a random, a randomized control trial. They all show good, uh, good outcomes. This first one doesn't show any functional improvement, but does show uh, uh, 
pain improvement. The other with Sentinel, 470 patient, that's a good thing. Uh, he's, he showed positive results, but 26% of the patient failed to show any improvement. You can see SI joint, another very important area. PRP for SI. So if you compare PRP versus corticosteroid, for number of patients, 40. So not too bad, not too good. At one month, no surprise, everybody did better, right? That's what steroid does. But at three months, the PRP group got even better, whereas the steroid group deteriorated. That's what we expect. And there's another case series with 10 patients also improved. And no adverse events. Again, we cannot miss out the prolotherapy for SI because it works, I think, just like magic. Uh, the study by Kim 2010 is a double blind randomized controlled trial, placebo uh, controlled. At two weeks, they found there's no difference. Uh, and at 15 months, the prolo group was much better than the corticosteroid group. I think I missed that. It's not a placebo control, it's a steroid control. Who are, you, who are your patients? Your patients are the ones who have the typical injury, like they fell on the buttocks. Uh, they will point at their PSIS as the tender area. You can do the provocative tests, but the definitive answer comes from the diagnostic injection. These are, these are your provocative tests. The distraction maneuver, the compression, the thigh thrust, the Faber, and the gain slam maneuver. This is a technique that I developed for making my own life easier but it might be nice for you guys to use as well. Here you see the ligaments of the SI joint. If you remember from those times when you did dissections, there is a lot, a lot of ligaments that stabilizes the whole pelvis. These are all important structures. So these are the ones that I'm gonna inject again for an SI patient. I'm gonna certainly not miss the sacred tuberous, the sacred spinous ligament. The green is the SI capsule and Start looking at this from now on. You will see when you have an SI patient, they will always have a facet problem as well. Except for the very, very young ones who just damaged their SI. Those can be isolated injuries. But the rest of the patients, which is majority, SI and facet goes hand in hand like this. So you've seen these targets that I inject, and this is how I inject. This is the view I want to get first. Right, so here you see the sacrum and the ilium. This is your ultrasound view, very typical with the S1 foramina. Then you slide your ultrasound to, to one side and then you inject. So position one in the center, position two, slide to the side, this is what you see. And then you inject. Right, position one, position two, I'm gonna remove that model. Okay. So here I'm going to the sacral surface and I pull back and then I go to the kind of like the under surface of the ilium and then I pull back. I redirect to position number three okay. and then I go again. This is the under surface of the iliac crest which is actually also the attachment for the iliolumbar ligament and then I go to position four which I don't show here and now we get to cervical spine that is my favorite I love cervical spine partly because other people don't like it I, it's high risk and I think I can help a lot of patients with cervical spine injection so what's the literature the literature is almost nothing so you guys need to publish everybody needs to publish this is a paper by Sentinel. Uh, what he studied, and this is a very interesting paper, even though it's very few patients, the concept is fascinating for me. So what he studied is the cervical spine movement. Uh, when 
when the, the two bones slide on each other, let's call the translation or glide. So what do you see on, on the image A? You can see uh, so here you can see that this vertebra has slipped forward on this one, and this is the translation. He decided if it's bigger than 3.5, that's a problem. Now the other problem, if there is this angle is bigger than 20 degrees, because normally it should be a nice and harmonious movement when you go into flexion. Here you can see a perfect spine, everything is lined up. And here on the right, you can see an imperfect spine where the C3 slips back and forth on C4. And this is a flexion extension movie. This is a lot of radiation. So don't routinely order this because you're buying a thyroid cancer for your patient. But you can see how C3 and C4 moves much more than, than the rest of the spine. C5, C4 slips forward and C5. What do we know about the flexion extension movies or films, just the film, not the movie, just the film. If uh, a regular cervical spine x-ray is only 80% sensitive to identify ligamentous injury after car accidents, whereas the flexion extension view is 99% sensitive. So going back to Sentinel study, he picked the patients where the trans cervical translation was bigger than 2.7 millimeter and he injected trauma therapy at that segment. That, and this is what he found, significant decrease in the translation in the C23, which is typically an MDA problem area, and the C56, which is again an M MDA problem area. And the VAS improved quite big in all the patients, not very many number of the patients. So what's the cervical PRP technique? Again, uh, we discussed we are thinking functional units. So I inject supraspinous ligaments, sets, the attachments of the superficial cervical muscles and the deep cervical muscles and the laminae. This is how I prep the patient. I put an IV. I even do sedation because it's, I'm an anesthesiologist, it's no extra effort. Uh, I tell them not to take any anti-inflammatory anti drugs prior to the procedure. And look at this pillow, it's quite nice. The patient is a nice, in a nice flexion, she can breathe and I can have good access to the cervical spine. This is how I inject, again, the fingers are bracketing, the fingers are bracketing the spine. Uh, spinous process, and then watch the depth of my needle. Again, the next spinous process. You make sure you're on bone and inject. How do you inject the facets? Uh, this technique, I also came up with it to make my own life easier. This is based on Finlayson's approach to the medial branch. He would come from posterior, right, towards anterior, and this is the middle of the articular pillar, target for the medial branch. But if you slide just a little bit caudal or cephalad, you actually see the joint. That's your target for uh, regenerative medicine. So here, uh, this is from a previous webinar. I'm doing cervical facet PRP or neck PRP, I should say. This is C1, it's nice and round. And I, before I check, this is vertebral artery there. I don't go there. The needle is coming from posterior. Only when you see it, that's when you advance and it, you inject on bone. This would be spinal cord. So go very, very, very carefully. If you don't see your needle, you do not inject. I also would like to emphasize that this procedure should only be done when you are 100% comfortable with knees, hips, shoulders, ankles, lumbar spine, and then you go to cervical spine. We must not kill any patients, but it's very easy with this. So here I slipped 
uh, I slipped a bit code that. You can see this is C2 with a bigger spinous process. And now I'm going for C3. C3 and down, it's actually much easier to see than the top two. But again, you want to make sure you see your needle. No needle, no go. And then I slide down again to the next level, C4. You visualize, you visualize the spinous lamina and spinous process and the articular pillar with the joint opening. And you can actually see the joint opening here. And this is the opening. And lamina and spinous process. That's how the whole thing would look. If you could see spinal cord there, the body is there. So here I am injecting the atlanto-occipital joints. When you nod, a lot of it is atlanto-occipital movement. The condyles glide in the C1. The, the images are identical, just one is highlighted, but you can see the contrast in it. And this is similarly, but the C1, C2 joint, here you can see the contrast, identical images on either side. How do you, uh, or what are the contraindications? I think the biggest contraindication is not understanding anatomy and then infection and lack of consent from the patient. Uh, poor lifestyle, smoking, obesity, lack of physical activity are contraindications or relative contraindications for all procedures. Patients don't do well unless they change. Okay? It's a carriage that both of you need to pull. You cannot be the horse. You can be a horse if the patient is a horse too, then the carriage will go. But alone, you cannot do. So I tend to refuse to do those patients where I have the feeling that it's all my job to fix them better. I refuse to do because they ruin my outcome. This is what I tell the patients for PRP. They come in and they hurt, let's say five or six. And then I do a treatment and they hurt more and it decreases and hurt more. And over time, they do better. And it's very similar with prolotherapy, you just need more treatments. So this is my conclusion slide for overall regenerative medicine. It treats the cause of the pain, it fixes or helps the biomechanical imbalance. You can use it for accidents and also for wear and tear. It will restore torus tendons, ligament and cartilages. In order to succeed, you need to understand the biomechanics. I think DOs, doctors, osteopathic doctors are at a huge advantage uh, compared to us MDs. I've been picking it up my biomechanics understandings at all kinds of conferences and other doctors. It's a tough one for us, but there is a way to learn it. And we have level one studies for lumbar disc, lumbar facet, SI joint, and minimal and low quality studies for a C-spine or epidural use. The good news is no harm, okay? And finally, this is, I, I wanna show you a case presentation. This is a 44 year old patient who first at around the age 24, noticed that she couldn't sleep through the night because she had to go in a, in a child pose and you cannot sleep in child pose. So she was up every hour and or hour or two. And at some point, she finally got the diagnosis of ah, lumbar facet problems. And this is early on, probably prolotherapy for the L3, L4, L5, S1 facets. Overall, she had two PRP, two prolo, and she's sleeping through the night. And that's a 20 year follow-up, very difficult patient. So thank you very much for listening to me. I know it's very hard with all the webinars and just listen, listen, listen. I'm ready for questions. And again, hope to meet you guys soon in, in real life. Thank you. Thank you, Agi, for a very comprehensive lecture. It is a very direct and very focused. 
especially with uh, your approaches in your lumbar spine and your, your cervical. Now, let me just throw the first question. Um, when you do your uh, intradiscal injection, uh, because there are studies which says that uh, sometimes there are leakages that goes out from the disc when you actually retract it. So do you use any gel to prevent the leak or anything like that? No, I don't, I don't use any gel, no. I stick my needle in the disc. I used to put contrast to make sure it's leaking, but I think I am becoming pretty confident based on the based on MRI and the clinical findings. So now I just stick my needle in the disc and I put my PRP in. And I put leukocyte poor PRP. Leukocyte poor. And it does leak. It does leak to the epidural space. I, I, I used to observe it when I did contrast. So it potentially it's an epidural and transfer amino treatment as well. So, so would you say that... Uh, it would be ideal to start first with Prolo, and then when the patient uh, doesn't respond to Prolo, then that's where you uh, progress to PRP, or you do them both? That's a difficult question, right? So, uh, two main concepts. Because I think that all disc and nerve problems started with a posterior element, ligamentous problem, I always, for every patient, I do lumbar spine prolotherapy or PRP. I would say it's a, a bit of a financial decision. I tend to tell my patients that 80% gets better with prolo, 85% gets better with PRP. So it's a little bit better, but the price is, a, is much more expensive, right? But it's not so much a medical decision. And if after the lumbar spine prolo, I still see that they cannot see there's a disc component or a nerve component, radiculopathy, then I do epidurolysis or disc PRP. Uh, the only thing that can change when they come in and they say, look, I have such a terrible leg pain, then I start with epidurolysis to get them better. But then I still do prolo for the lumbar spine or PRP in the disc. I only do PRP or stem cells. I don't do prolo. But it's based on lack of studies and my belief that PRP is good. But again, it's a belief. It's not a knowing. Yeah. Okay, there's one more question here from Dr. Sari. Uh, I think this is related to the first one. Is it necessary to combine prolo and PRP and why? That's his question. I think I just answered it. You don't have to, you don't have to combine it at all. Uh, no. When it comes to the posterior elements, I would say most of the time you will succeed with prolotherapy, which is cheap. Now, sometimes with very difficult patients, I do switch to PRP and sometimes I do get good results. Mm -hmm. But to be ethical, I tend to choose the cheaper first. Unless the patient comes in and says, you look, I don't care for money. I want to come less. PRP is six times, right? So it's a, that's a lot of times to come back. Some patients say, I, want, I don't want to come so often. I don't mind. Just do PRP. Then I do PRP. But for the outcome, I'm not sure there is a big difference. We are actually doing a comparative study now for C-spine and lumbar spine. So I'm very curious to see what will be the outcome. How about PRP and ozone? Have you tried ozone, PRP and ozone? I just purchased my ozone machine. I will have the orientation on Wednesday on how to use it. I'm curious to hear. Do you combine PRP and ozone? <laughs> uh, do you? Well, uh, I don't do ozone, but I've seen studies uh, saying there's no difference if you do ozone and PRP and PRP only. So... I don't know. I will really, I will have to figure it out. And when I have the answer, I will tell you guys. It's going to be a couple of years probably to gain enough experience. Right, right. Uh, another question is, uh, there's always that concern in the neck, especially for a severe spasm of the, of the neck, where the patient would have difficulty in swallowing. Do you, do you 
have the yes. with your patient? Oh, lovely so that somebody asked that because that means somebody already figured out that swallowing can be influenced by C-spine biomechanics. And yes, they actually can improve in their swallowing if it's truly a biomechanical problem. It's very, very rewarding. Like, it's so rewarding. You just gotta do it. Just do a good physical exam. And if you find that it is a neck problem, you do PRP or prolo, and they will be able to swallow. It's fascinating. Which area would you approach? The facet, the ligaments, or? So that slide with the lovely colorful dots, I really treat neck as a functional unit. I treat all those targets, which makes it hard work, I can tell you. It's, it's more work than doing a radio frequency, but the outcome is so much more better that it's worth it. So you treat everything, the ligaments? Everything. I modify my treatment really based on the mechanism of injury. I showed you a general pattern. I, I modify it slightly if they were uh, T-bone from the side in a car accident. It, it depends, really. Is it more headache? Is it more the shoulder area? It's again, going back to the biomechanics. I see. Because uh, the, usual, the usual approach is, of course, uh, we see here a lot of doctors using MRI as their basis for treatment. So how would you uh, see MRI coming in uh, with the biomechanic problem? It's very, I mean, MRI is super helpful uh, to get comfortable with you find, what you find with good physical exam and history. But honestly, the physical exam and the history will give you 99% uh, confidence of what's going on. Then you have an MRI. The MRI will tell you if there's a leaking disc. That's useful, especially in the cervical spine, right? You see a HIZ on the MRI. And of course, if it confirms the radiculopathy, the, the foraminal compression of the exactly what you found on physical exam, then it gives you comfort that you're on the right track. But you cannot base your diagnosis on the MRI because the MRI anatomy it doesn't show pain okay there's one more question here Apash, go ahead you ask questions to dr agi good evening dr agi and good afternoon thank you so much for this very informative lecture um my question is uh for prp does age dictate some of the number of sessions that you do? Like, of course, uh, by theory, the younger patients would probably improve, you know, better in terms of regenerative treatments. Uh, do you tend to do more sessions for the ages uh, higher than 35 years old, let's say? No, no. Very interesting that I really don't. Uh, my... <laughs> One of the favorite group of my patients is the lovely old ladies because they respond so fast, so well. And I don't see that they would need more sessions. Uh, what I see is, let's pick an extreme. If somebody has Ehlers-Danlos disease, they can only build Ehlers-Danlos ligaments, which are not as good as your ligaments. So Ehlers-Danlos patients would need more sessions, but the other average population, I don't find a difference between old and young. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. You're okay. muted. Mute. Can me know? Okay, yeah, I, I got it. Okay, so uh, it was very well explained, Dr. Agi, and uh, we really appreciate your time. I know you're so busy. You, you just came from the Army uh, regenerative conference in Utah and then you're here again and maybe <laughs> for some reason you're busy with your clinics and all these stuffs and uh, we appreciate you for your time and uh, we thank you for giving us this opportunity to learn news of things on uh, the approaches in the lumbar spine and the cervical spine. So thank you very much Dr. Agi. And, uh, thank you, thank you very much. It was lovely to see you. I wish I could see everybody else. Take yeah. care. And yeah. if you have yeah. questions, you can email me. It's my last name, Kogitsa at gmail.com. Thank right. you. Have Thank a lovely you. evening. Yeah, have a lovely evening too. So God bless. Bye -bye. And take care. Bye.